Teresa had always dreamed of a life filled with glory and luxury. But how did she work on attaining this dream? This is a case of two men, one being a pastor with a troubled past, who loved one woman, and how it all came crashing down. It's the case of Teresa Stone, right now on Love and Murder. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Love and Murder, the weekly true crime podcast discussing relationships gone terribly wrong, where our motto is, say it with me, you're either someone's last love or their first murder. I am your host, Kai. And if you want to know why I wasn't here last week, go on over to our Patreon and I'll give you the story over there. In the meantime, This show discusses true crime cases told in the form of a story with mystery and suspense. If you're a true crime fanatic and want to stay updated on the latest episodes of Love and Murder, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Also, please consider joining our Patreon to support the show and gain access to exclusive content. In today's episode, I'll tell you about the case of David Love, This case is a tragic reminder that affairs and obsession can have deadly consequences. But first, I wanted to remind you to head on over to our exclusive group at patreon.com forward slash love and murder, where we have bonus episodes such as the case of Charles Starkweather and Jennifer Schuster. We also have extras in there and so much more. I I don't want to take up the time in the beginning of the episode talking about it, so we'll talk about this more at the end of the episode. But you want to go over to our Patreon, www.patreon.com forward slash love and murder and subscribe for $1 a month and above. Now on to the show. Teresa was born on December 6, 1971 in the northeast area of Kansas City. Her and Randy Stone grew up together, but didn't actually begin dating until 1990, when Randy had come back from being active duty in the Marines. Randy was described as being a tough guy with a heart of gold, and Teresa was described as being very pretty and a person who loved to flirt. When Randy returned from active duty, that's when he asked Teresa out on a date. This was around March. And seven uh, months later, on October 13th, 1990, they were married. Seven months, that's all it took. They had their first child, a son, a year later, and a daughter two years after that. Randy started a farmer's insurance business. Remember farmers? We are farmers. I shouldn't say that, huh? (laughs) Before they copyright me. (laughs) Anyway, he started a farmer's insurance business that he was very passionate about and that he managed successfully. In fact, he would built his agency into one of the most successful in his region. He was also a fitness enthusiast, and he loved competing on the basketball court. Like I said, he was described as also having a heart of gold. So he would often write poetry for his wife. He kept a journal. He was really, really romantic. And he drove the church's Sunday school bus. He even offered free advice on financial matters to the churchgoers. Teresa, on the other hand, was Randy's reliable business partner and helped with the daily operations of their farmer's insurance agency. She started as a customer service representative before becoming a licensed agent. With Teresa handling the office's affairs, Randy focused on managing their client relationships, which is an amazing partnership because literally not one person can do everything in business. So he had a great partnership, which led to his success. As a couple, they spent many hours at their local church, New Hope Baptist, where they had been married, and this is a church that Teresa grew up going to. Besides spending time there, Teresa volunteered in the church kitchen and sang with the choir. Randy managed the church's finances, which he was really a stickler for, and oversaw the money coming in and going out as the minister of records. Randy and Teresa's love story was a heartwarming and inspiring one for the community. They worked hard and hand in hand, supporting each other and building a beautiful life together. When David Love became the pastor of the New Hope Church at 38 years old in 1999, the congregation was thrilled. He was young, energetic, and had fresh ideas to lead them. David grew up in the Midwest and was the son of missionaries. He'd gone to a Baptist college in the South and learned how to preach there. 
He was then a pastor and a youth minister at two churches before coming to this one. For Randy Stone, one of his devoted followers, Brother Love, as they called him, was a powerful influence in his life. As a smooth and charismatic speaker, David preached at their church, sticking to the conservative's preaching style. Randy liked this as he once told a friend that the, quote, mainstream Southern Baptist convention was too liberal and willing to compromise, end quote. David and Randy occasionally argued about church issues. It's good to note that David battled financial issues in the past, which had split a Virginia congregation in the 1990s. Also, when he took over the ministry at Independence, he couldn't account for $30,000 missing from a fund for missionary salaries. And when they asked him about it, he got mad. Quote, I will not let a church checkbook run my ministry. End quote. Despite these red flags, David put up the face of a perfect preacher, attending to his wife, their kids, and their congregation. Kim was a fiercely faithful individual and played the role of a mother, church secretary, and pastor spouse with ease. David and Kim had met in college in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and David had proposed to her overlooking the city, and they were wed on June 26, 1982. According to Kim, David treated her like a queen, but as time passed, she grew weary of women drawn to handsome preachers. I didn't even know that was a thing. More times than you can count on one hand, she'd found herself directing her husband's attention away from other women. This now included Teresa Stone. In 2004, after being married for 14 years, Teresa announced that she was pregnant again. The only problem is that Randy had already had a vasectomy. Teresa, you have some splaining to do. Either way, Randy assumed that this was his child because he'd heard like vasectomies weren't always working, didn't always work. So if you get a vasectomy or even a, I, I forgot what it's the medical term, like if you tie the woman's tubes, they tell you that it's 99.99% effective. They give that 0.001% so they're not liable for anything. Same as condoms or any other contraceptives. So he'd actually known a couple people who'd had a vasectomy and they still had children after that. So he wasn't really concerned. I mean, he probably had that thought in his head, but then he was like, well, you know, I know two people that this happened to. And he didn't attend his follow-up procedures. So he just got the vasectomy and he never went back so that they can make sure that it took, um, cause sometimes the tubes just automatically, uh, regenerate, grow back together. So he never went and did his follow up. So, you know, he was like, okay, well maybe, maybe it's mine. Unfortunately, Teresa suffered a miscarriage and the baby just wasn't to be. In 2008, Randy said he was going to resign from the church. He told some followers that he believed that David and his wife were having an affair. The person convinced Randy that he was being ridiculous. Teresa loves you, you know that, and David would never do that. So Randy, you know, was like, well, maybe it's just just me. I don't know. Maybe I'm just going crazy. So he stayed in the church and even started doing weekly counseling with David after Teresa caught him watching porn. I know y'all can't see my face, but okay. <laughs> On March 31st, 2010, as Teresa arrived at her husband's insurance agency, she immediately noticed something strange. The blinds to the business were closed, even though his car was there. And this was unusual since Randy never closed the blinds before dark. So she knew something was wrong. Teresa unlocked the door with ease, which also indicated that the, deadbolt, the deadbolt had not been engaged, which is not something else that was weird. And she called out to Randy, but no one answered. She searched through the storage room and Randy's office and, you know, like everywhere in the front of the office and everything looked normal. But going further into the office, that's when she found her husband. Randy was laying motionless on the floor right next to her desk with blood spilling from his left ear and just pooling on the ground. There was a space heater behind him, which was toppled over and that also had blood like smeared on it. Furniture and walls were splattered with blood. Randy's eyes had blackened and his lips were blue. So Teresa freaked out and she called her parents. And then she called 911. But why would you call your parents first? 
I don't know, shock? I, I don't know, I guess... I wonder if I would default to calling my mom first. Maybe. I don't know. Can't can't judge somebody for doing that. So her 911 call actually looked for the call, but it couldn't find it. So let's say it here. 911, <coughs> what's your emergency? Oh my God. 911, do you need police, fire, or medical? Yes, I do, please. Uh, okay, take a breath. Where are you at? I... I just walked into my office and my my husband's lying on the floor in my office. Okay, listen to me, listen to me. Where are you? I need the address of where you're at. It's 13912 Nolan Court. Okay, what's the suite number? Suite A as in Apple. Okay, now what's wrong with your husband? He's been, he's, I don't know. There's blood everywhere. It's coming out of his ear. Go outside and wait for the police to arrive. Teresa went outside and a church member arrived ahead of the police. He went inside and came back out to tell Teresa that Randy was indeed dead. Why'd you, why'd you have to go inside and do that? I'm pretty sure she knew that already. But I mean, I guess maybe he just wanted to see for himself. After hearing through the grapevine what happened, David sent a youth minister to the scene while he was on his way himself. Then Kim pulled up to the office too. So now is the entire office going to, I mean, is the entire town going to get there before the police get there? It's like everybody is moving faster than the cops. What in the world is going on here? Finally, police arrived and 30 minutes earlier than when he'd said he would, David arrived as well. So he said, I'm on my way. I should be an hour out. And then he got there 30 minutes earlier. You know what I'm saying? So instead of getting there in an hour, like he said, he got there in 30 minutes. Six detectives began investigating inside and someone asked him to drive Teresa, who was just like really freaking out, drive her to a restroom, let her get herself together and everything like that, and then bring her back. So Kim said that she would do it and got um, Teresa in the car. But Kim said later on that while she was in the car with Teresa, she was wondering if Teresa had killed her husband. Now then my thing is, why would you think... They were met with the sight of grieving family, friends, and church members. Investigator Keith Rose Warren was already on the scene, ready to take charge in this investigation. Like Randy, Rose Warren was a proud veteran and had served in um, Iraq and Afghanistan. And so this actually made him kind of develop a kinship to Randy because, you know, you kind of feel like we went through the same things. So you kind of develop like, this could have been me. Investigators saw that there were no signs of a struggle and Randy had been ambushed and shot point blank in the back of the head. The murder weapon was also missing. Surprisingly though, the cash on Randy's desk had not been taken. So this made people and police think that, you know, well, this couldn't have been a robbery because everything here to rob is still literally here. The case was officially ruled as a homicide. During the course of the investigation, the police found a torn up note in Teresa's office trash can. The letter, which was written by someone in handwriting, was examined by the police. According to ABC News, it contained phrases such as, quote, Happy birthday, love. I am not in control of things yet, but when we are fully together, your birthday will always be exciting. End quote. Uh oh. The police compared the handwriting of the letter to Randy's writing samples, but it didn't match. So this ain't her husband. It was either a love letter or a happy birthday note. But so far to police, its true purpose remains a mystery. To me, that don't sound like no random happy birthday. I am not in control of things yet, but when we're fully together, uh, that part, that's not a happy birthday. If it said happy birthday, love... I could even see that. Your birthday will always be exciting. That could be anybody. But I'm not in control of things yet. But when we're fully together, uh, sounds like somebody that you're cheating with. I mean, y'all tell me, if your significant other came home with a birthday card with that in it, and it ain't from you, what are you going to think? According to police, it seemed like Randy knew whoever killed him and trusted him because the murder happened on like, a busy commercial street and nobody who's going to do a random murder is going to do it just on such a busy street. They're going to look for 
quiet, you know, a time when maybe all offices are closed, all of that stuff. As investigators, uh, well, as the, I was going to say as investigators investigated the scene, <laughs> but let's switch that up. As detectives investigated the scene, they put Teresa in a squad car. And in the meantime, check this out. David tried to get in a car too, even though police told him no. He kept trying to get in the car to talk to Teresa. When they asked about their alibi, Teresa provided an airtight alibi, and David did too, but uh, police suspected that Randy was murdered with his own gun, and Teresa couldn't confirm who bought the gun. Like, it's his gun. You can't confirm that he bought a gun that was his? Okay. David, as we know, was a close friend, you know, friend of me, whatever, friend of Randy's. He was the person who gave the eulogy at his funeral. And at the funeral, people were talking, mumbling, not worrying about the funeral, but gossiping about, I think, uh, I think David was having an affair with Teresa. And that's what they were saying at the funeral. And everybody was kind of like, you know, it's kind of funny how both of them had a really, really ridiculously detailed account of their whereabouts at the time of the murder and police let them go because of that. So none of them were arrested, but they really had these mapped out, like this is where I was at 8.05 and at 8.06, I was walking towards the door and at 8.10, I had just made it through the door and at 8.15, I got in the car and turned the key, like really, really detailed. Nobody remembers details that accurately. Robert Davis, a farmer's insurance district manager, went to the Stone's home after Teresa called to inform him of her husband's death. At the house, Robert met a distraught Teresa with her parents there. When Teresa and Robert examined three insurance policies that had pl been placed in this desk, uh, one of um, Randy's desks in the basement office, they discovered that Randy had carried about $725,000 in life insurance benefits. However, they later learned that the amount was actually closer to $575,000, which is still a lot. In addition, Randy had made his children the sole beneficiaries of the policy instead of Teresa. So basically before Teresa was on there and she was the sole beneficiary, but somewhere along the line, Randy had changed that. And when Robert informed Teresa about this, he realized that she did not know. So she was just there with a dumb look on her face like, oh, uh. the day after Randy was murdered, David received a call from a fellow pastor named David Trump asking him how was he, how was his, fam his followers doing, his family, everything like that. You know, just a checkup call. And we're also going to call David Trump David T from now on. David responded with a happy quote from an old hymn, sounded happy, said everything's great, and even managed to switch the subject to the NCAA basketball tournament. That same morning, David T. got another phone call, this time from Teresa, another distant friend he hadn't spoken to in a while. So basically, he called David to check in on him, and then right after that, he got a call from Teresa. She broke the news that her husband had been shot the day before. And after a brief 10 minute call, David T called David back to confirm that this wasn't some sort of joke. Now my question is, why would he think it was a joke? Who jokes that my husband was shot? Like, but I guess it's just, he called David to find out how everything was going. David never mentioned it, never said anything was wrong, sounded happy, you know? So it's kind of like, what? So while David T was talking to David, he started remembering a conversation he'd had with Randy. Back in 2002, Randy had talked about finding a letter from Teresa with sexual fantasies addressed to someone named, quote, David. And when Randy confronted her, Teresa claimed that writing was a fake affair letter. And I just did this because I thought like, if you found it, you'll get jealous and it'll improve our sex life. But what if he never found it? Cause I mean, I'm pretty sure that letter wasn't like out in the open. So you're hiding it. And your excuse was like, well, I thought if you found it, you would be like, oh, who is this from? But being that you usually hide these type of things or somebody would think you would hide these type of things. Why would you think he would find it? That doesn't, 
I mean, I guess if that's if that's her story. <laughs> in the meantime, Detective Keith Rosewarren was still heading the investigation and trying to prove the rumors of the affair between David and Therese, Teresa because that's all they were right now was just rumors. He had already successfully interviewed Teresa, who initially said that the note seemed to have been from a secret admirer and agreed to be questioned in a second interview, this time without an attorney present. The detectives believed that Teresa had given David a gun that belonged to her deceased husband and that they had talked about the killing and communicated through disposable cell phones. But even with all these suspicions, Rose Warren knew that procedures would, you know, would be needed to get more evidence before they could press charges. So he believed that he needed to crack Teresa's defenses and hoped he could use the birthday note that was found in her trash can to his advantage. So when she came in, you know, and they started interviewing everything, initially she claimed to have no idea of who wrote the note. And she said it had been on her windshield like three years earlier. So it's just secret admirer. I'm gorgeous. Can't you see people love me? I don't know. I just walked out and that was on my windshield. Teresa said that, of course, I tore it up. I love my husband. I would never. Come on. And so she's the one who tore it up and put it in the trash can. That's what she said. And then my question would be, why so soon? You got this letter three years ago and just now you're starting to tie it, uh, tear it up? Why so soon? I'm just wondering. Maybe you could have done it faster? I, I don't know. I, I don't know. So after prying her in this investigation, because they just, her story wasn't adding up, finally, she made a, t- a shocking confession. Quote, yes, we had sex. Teresa confessed that she had been involved in a secret affair with, quote, brother love, as she called him, for over 10 years. Dude, remember when Teresa said she'd been pregnant after Randy had a vasectomy? Well, she revealed that the baby was actually David's and when she'd had a miscarriage, she was actually happy that she wouldn't have to deal with the outcome of Randy finding this all out. Or maybe, I I don't know, this is going to be, so you sit down for this guys. Like I, I just had a crazy idea. Maybe stick with me here. Don't cheat. I'm just, just crazy. I I, I know these crazy things just pop in my head. Just one year after David arrived. So this is the story. Basically it's coming out. This is the story. One year after David arrived, he invited her into his office and pretty soon they started meeting up regularly. Sometimes they would meet a few times a day. Um, Okay, so actually it started off as they would meet once a month. Then it was like every other week. Then it became weekly. Then it became multiple times a week. Then it became multiple times a day. (laughs) Oh my God. And as Teresa said, at the same time, she still had to fulfill her husband's need for affection. And oh, oh, poor girl. This just wore her out, you know, having two men. Oh, maybe stick with your husband. Randy suspected that she was having an affair with the pastor and started receiving counseling from David, but that only fueled the affair more, which became more passionate and sometimes even reckless, which is why the whole town probably knew about it. David even posed for intimate photos that he sent to Teresa. Dude, he was doing naked selfies. And in January 2009, he wrote her a series of passionate emails. They even imagined what what it would be like to be married. You are married. Go back to your husband. You go back to your wife. Both of you have children. What the? But that's not the end of it. As investigations continued, Teresa went on to reveal a far more sinister twist to the story. One that actually ended up implicating David in the murder of Randy. She said that David had called her to tell her that Randy had been shot. Shocked by this, the police immediately sought a search warrant to investigate further. They brought David in for interrogation, in which he really didn't speak. However, during the search of David's property the police found incriminating evidence in his computer, including pictures and evidence of emails which showed his involvement in the murder. Because it's like we always say, people, 
If you're going to commit a murder, have as much evidence on your person and around you on your computer and on your phone as possible. Also tell everybody, you know, and everybody you don't. In the meantime, as news spread of the investigation, witnesses who had been quiet before, I don't know how quiet they were because the whole town was gossiping, but they were quiet before, now started to talk, singing like a bird. And the police slowly began to piece things together and the events that led up to Randy's death. So basically, with the story from Teresa, with the story from the town, and with no help from David, they're finally finding out what happened. Another major turning point in the investigation came when a crime lab confirmed that Randy had indeed been killed by his own gun. So before they were just speculating, but now it's confirmed. And that means that he definitely knew his killer. And when they asked Teresa about it, she said that David had thrown the gun away after the murder, but police still weren't ever able to find it. The police did, however, manage to recover five old shell casings that had been fired from the gun. Experts later matched these casings with the one that had been found near Randy's feet on the day he died. This was another major breakthrough for the police, and it gave them a crucial piece of evidence to build their case upon. They are just building and building and building that case, aren't they? As the investigation progressed, it was discovered that Randy's insurance policy, so now the police are discovering this, like we knew this already. Uh, uh, um, what's her name again? Teresa knew this, but now the police are just now finding out that Randy's insurance policy would not pay it out to Teresa. So she didn't disclose that to them. They had to find that out on their own. And apparently she was talking to her friends and saying that, yeah, his insurance policy paid out to us and helped us out or whatever. This is what she was telling her friends. But when the police investigated and found out, it was like, oh, no, no, that's not what happened. So you had an insurance policy and your husband changed it to your kid. How long, Teresa, did you know that this happened? Just imagine she would have been like, oh, I found out on the day the insurance people came and told me, like after he was dead. <laughs> So in their investigation, they actually were able to find out exactly when Randy had done this. He had taken her off his insurance policy several years ago after she had miscarried uh, David's child. So although he was trying to convince himself that was his, he knew in the back of his mind it wasn't. He knew it. And he took her off his insurance policy and put it in his kid's name. Finally, computer forensics gave the police an insight into the motive behind Randy's murder. It was revealed that just two weeks before his death, Randy had made the decision to leave his church. So I guess he was thinking about it before, and then now he was like, I'm leaving. And I mean, there's so many motives behind his death. It's, I mean, but I guess this is the one they stuck to. But to me, they, it seems like there are many motives behind his, his death. So he decided to leave the church citing concerns about their finances because in early 2010, Randy had discovered an issue with the church's finances and he was going over the books and he saw missing funds. The checks and balances pr procedures were not being followed and the money that had been gone, uh, had been gone. The money that had gone missing had David's signature on the checks. So everything, every time something was missing, it had David's signature on these checks. So Randy had sent an email to David stating that, you know, he didn't agree with what was going on with the church's finances. Like, this doesn't look right to me. I don't agree with this. You need to stop. And David was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And he's like, dude, your name is literally right here. I, I'm literally looking at it right here. And David was like, I, I honestly don't know what you're talking about. And so Randy was just like, okay, whatever. I don't agree with this and just whatever. But he didn't take his allegations to the police that he thought David was stealing because I guess he figured like, yeah, there's signatures here, but there's no other evidence and it's my word against his and all this stuff. And I don't want all the problems for me and my family with the community. So he just didn't go to the cops. However, I want to ask y'all, doesn't this scenario sound $30,000 familiar? I'm just asking, just wondering. 
Another reason that Randy was leaving, so it wasn't just one. I think it was like three. I think it was the money. I think it was his suspicions of David and Teresa. And then this thing here, which was Randy found out that David's son, who actually worked at, at as, why can't I say as, who actually worked as New Hope's music director, had been charged with drunk driving. So Randy approached David about that. And what David was worried about was that, um, being that his church members were really conservative, they might want to see him dismissed from his position. And because of all of this going on, Randy just started to have a lot of disagreements with David. Uh, he told David he was being too prideful, which then hurt David's pride. (laughs) Um, and David constantly tried to like diffuse the situation because he didn't want to be kicked out of his position, but Randy was having none of it. And he went on to even accuse David's wife of sexual indiscretions and which is weird because it's his wife. But anyway, and he even confronted Teresa one time about a ring that David had gifted her, a ring that David had gifted her. Dude. So after all of this information came out, which was basically seven months after the murder, detectives Keith and Christina Nunez spoke to David's boss at a trucking company. Like he worked at a trucking company. uh, Well, before he had worked at a trucking company and he spoke to that boss, David's former boss, and told him like, hey, we need you to try and lure David uh, to come in, like maybe saying you have a check for him or something like that. So... By this time, David has re- had resigned as the pastor of the New Hope Baptist Church. So he wasn't even there anymore and he had left independence. Like he was like out, straight gone. And he relocated him and his wife and his family and everybody to South Carolina. So he wasn't, you know, listening to the cop. He didn't, they th- he thought they didn't have anything to hold him on. They didn't want him to flee again. So this is why they asked his uh, ex boss to, like, hey, um, Call him up here and tell him you have a check for him or something. So the supervisor did call David and told him to come in and sign him some paperwork. And when David got to the terminal, detectives could see that he was like acting all suspicious. Like, you know, he didn't trust why he was there. And he actually left at one point and he came back with his wife. And then he left again. But this time when he left, Rose Warren and Nunez followed him back to his house and that's when they, you know, they got him. Like, Get out of the car, you know. Oh my God, hands in the air, stuff like that. And they handcuffed him at his house. And David immediately asked for an attorney, and he said he didn't trust the detectives. So that's why he's like, I'm not talking to y'all. I don't trust y'all. I want my attorney present. However, when Rose Warren pushed the issue of closure, like you know, you gotta really like let us know what happened here. You want the family to have closure. Wouldn't you want to have closure? Like, you know, suppose somebody did this to your child. Wouldn't you want to have closure? So when the detective was pushing that, David finally broke down and said, quote, Randy was a friend of mine too. Okay. (laughs) But you killed him. So eight months after Randy, her husband's murder, Teresa was ready to come clean about the final secrets that she'd been holding. Even though she had a fear that, you know, this might land her in prison or longer prison sentence or whatever, she decided she was going to come completely clean. So detectives called her in. Of course, they're not going to say, no, we've heard enough. It's fine. They called her in and they took her to a small private office and, you know, tried to keep calm and, you know, tried to nudge her to to talk. And so she finally went into detail of how David got access to Randy's 40 caliber Glock. The only reason she was doing this, obviously, was not because she felt it was her moral duty, not because she felt bad for the family, not because she felt bad that her husband was murdered, but because she hoped to gain some leniency by cooperating with prosecutors. But, you know, the detectives were, they wanted to take her her statement, but they didn't want to use her statement as a witness against David because they felt she could be easily discredited. 
So they told her that she would have to prove herself with honest answers. You you can't lie. One lie and it's over and, you know, we're not doing this plea deal or whatever. So veteran defense lawyer John P. O'Connor went in with Teresa and she said she was going to answer any and all questions honestly and, quote, without conditions or promises. And I guess there were conditions and promises, but you have to have that on the book, so... So assistant prosecutor Tammy Dickinson, who was in there to ask Teresa questions, got straight to the point. She got straight to the point. Teresa sat down and in five seconds, Tammy was like, what, what do you got to tell me? Let me know. Here's a question and you answer it. And Teresa admitted that she helped turn David into a killer by sending him a text stating, quote, I want him dead. Damn. So that was the catalyst. And she just confessed that she just wanted, she just wanted Randy out of her life. That was it. And you know, for some reason, this part I'm putting in, but for some reason, a divorce was not the option because logic, but whatever, she wanted him out of her life. And she also revealed that she gave David access to Randy's gun, uh, by providing him with all the passwords. Here's the key to my house, my safe, my social, my kids, social, just everything. She gave him everything. So with all of that, Finally, prosecutors had enough evidence they believed to send to a grand jury and to have a fair trial. Now, David eventually took a plea deal for second degree murder. Are you kidding me? I thought David had nothing to say. Now you're taking plea deals? And was sentenced to life imprisonment with the possibility of parole in 2036. I mean, there's a possibility of parole? So basically, he had to be in there for 25 years before he had a possibility of parole. In April 2012, Teresa pled guilty and was charged with conspiracy to commit murder and entered a plea deal for reduced charges. Of course she did. So with all the evidence that was against her and the plea deal that she took, she faced an eight-year prison sentence. Prosecutor Dickinson said that these two could have chosen divorce, like I said, but instead they chose murder. Randy's family voiced their disappointment in the length of Teresa's sentence, which I would have too, only eight years, really? With many wishing, she would have gone away for more than eight years. During the trial, Randy's niece, Shelly Bell, asked that Teresa receive the maximum sentence for her, quote, cold-hearted decision. On the other hand, Teresa's lawyer, John P. O'Connor, told the judge that Stone had no criminal record and had gone back to school since her husband's death. What the hell does that have to do with the price of tea in Japan, China, Africa, and the Middle East? I don't understand that. Also, Teresa's children, Michael and Miranda, that's their name. I'd never said their name before, but her her children and Randy's children had asked the judge to show Teresa's mercy, stating that they needed her in their lives and couldn't bear to lose her after already losing their father. Wow, they're very forgiven. After the sentencing, attorney O'Connor accepted the judge's decision, I mean, like, you have no choice, stating that it had been under, um, well, it had been given under fair circumstances. Randy's mother, Clara Kohler, yeah, Clara Kohler, expressed satisfaction with the eight-year sentence. Really? Stating that she wanted Teresa to have time to reflect on what she had done. I mean, okay, I guess to each his own. Randy is currently incarcerated at the Southeast Correctional Center in Charleston, Missouri. By the time of this recording, Teresa has started a new life with a new partner in Kansas City, Missouri, after serving her sentence. Someone got with her? Look, single women who don't have a prison sentence for getting someone to murder your ex, you still have a chance. And that is the case of Teresa Stone, Randy Stone, and David Love. What did you think of all this craziness? I'd love to hear your thoughts. You can let me know in the comments below or go to my website, www.murderandlove.com. Hit that orange button on our homepage and record a message for us. If your message is relevant and respectful, you might hear them in an episode. So if you like this episode, I would love, love, love if you went over to Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever platform you're on and rate this show five stars. That would help me out so, 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 so much. 
Don't forget to visit us on Patreon. Like I said, www.patreon.com and become an exclusive member of the Lamb community. In there, you would get commercial-free episodes. Uh, This episode, like for instance, would be commercial-free um, you'll get early release. You'll also get whatever extras that the ca- of the case we're covering. So you get the pictures, you get pictures of like maybe the crime scene or the murder weapon, uh, whatever videos come with it. Sometimes very, very rarely there's nothing extra to add, but more than not, you get a whole slew of other things when it comes to our full length episodes and you get that in our Patreon. You also get bonus content like cases about love obsession, um, crazy cases, serial killer corner, um, random cases that I found that I wanted to share with you. Um, you get up to date, like whole stories. Like for instance, last week I didn't, uh, post a show. So in my bonus episode, you'll get to hear why, what was going on with me, why the show didn't come out. Where's Rick, for instance, where's Char, all that stuff. You get that in the Patreon, you get behind the scenes, you get bloopers. So, so, so much more. There are options starting at only $1 a month. So with $1, you get the commercial free episodes and all the extras in the full length episode, but you don't get bonus episodes. So for $1 a month, you basically get that. And the best tier that I'm, I'm telling y'all, the best tier is like the $5 and above where you get the extras, the bonuses, you get to converse with all your other lamb fans out there, just all of that. Follow us on social media. All of the links are in the comments below. Join us on our YouTube where there's actually extra over there also. So if you're on our Patreon, you get the extra that comes from YouTube. So you don't have to go to all these different places. It just comes directly to you. But if you're not in Patreon, go over to our YouTube, subscribe over there so you can get extra content over there as well. An easy and free way that I would ask you to help me out is by just sharing this episode. That's it. Just hit the share button. Share with everybody you know. And that's it. So easy, right? And as always, I end each episode by reminding you that it's all love and no murder, y'all. Bye.